Okay. Um, so welcome everyone to the uh, Fermat's last theorem conference. Um, before we start, um, I just wanted to make a couple of announcements. Uh, oh, my name is Glenn Stevens, by the way. Um, I'm here at Boston University. Um, um, so um, I think I don't know if everybody's got a chance to register. There was some confusion with registration this morning. The registration desk will be open um, all day long. Um, and so between talks, if you haven't registered yet, you can go register there. Um, and there are packets there to pick up and information on the computers and things like that. Um, a couple people have asked about computer accounts. Uh, people like to call ho or send email home. Um, so um, um, there, are there is a, a conference computer account that you can use for telnetting to your home institution. And there's a, a, a piece of paper that you'll find on the table out there, the registration table that explains sort of everything you need to know about it. There will be a, a Mac lab available open in the uh, Rich Hall in the dormitories that you can use, but it won't be open until Saturday. Okay, so in the meantime, if you have any pressing email messages to send out, um, you should send them. Uh, go to the, over to the mathematics department at Cumming, on Cummington Street or, um, or maybe over to the Mugar Library. There are some uh, computer terminals in there that you can use. Um, <clears throat> okay, so is Ted McCabe here? Ah, and Ted McCabe, um, one of our graduate students here at Boston University, um, will be the contact person. If you have any questions about the computer, be sure to talk to Ted. Um, okay. Um, Okay, so I'm also supposed to tell you that uh, your name tag, in case you didn't know, you've probably noticed they all have these colors on them. Those are your, uh, those are your meal tickets. Okay, so you have, don't throw away your name tag. Keep your name tag, you, so that's, that's how you'll get your food. Um, um, okay, and then the last announcement, I think, um, is that there are two exits. Okay, so most people came in through this one over here, but in fact there's another exit over here. And uh, actually, that exit over there will take you upstairs to the area where the refreshments are faster. Um, <laughs> OK. Um, OK, um, so the, the, um, the topic of our conference um, is, well, we're going to prove from Oz's last theorem. So let me just, everybody knows what it says. So if you have a a natural number n greater than 2, um, then from Oz's last theorem for the exponent n says that if, if you have a sum of 2 nth powers equal to an nth power in z, uh, <coughs> so a, b, c, and z, then in fact the product of the three integers has to be 0. Um, in other words, there are no non-trivial solutions of from Oz's last theorem. Uh, of this equation. Um, well, so this is a very famous statement by now, and let me just remind you that um, Fermat was apparently the first person to work on this, and he proved the exponent 4 case around 1640. <coughs> um, and then it's possible, we don't really know, or there may, al I'm sorry, Fermat may also have proven it for exponent 3, but it seems that Euler is the first one to have published a proof, and that was around someplace between 1758 and 1760, 1770 maybe, um, someplace in there. The, uh, the, the proof, that I, th I don't think he actually published it until 1770, and the proof that he published wasn't even complete. Um, but it was easy to, to fill in the details by using other things that he had done. Um, and so uh, the general feeling is that he did have a complete proof. Um, and let's see, so for uh, exponent 5, Dirichlet and Legendre, did this um, around um, 1825. There was also some confusion surrounding this. Um, so maybe there was a three year period there before the details were straight. Um, and the case of exponent 7. Uh, was finally filled by Lamey around 1838. Um, now, one of the things that's striking, I think, or, about this is that, um, in fact, these, even these very small exponents um, seem to have been very hard uh, to come by uh, to get proofs. Um, by now, of course, with uh, all the 
all the computers that we have and all the people who've worked on it, uh, we've actually managed to prove from Oz last theorem uh, before whiles um, up to exponent, uh, prime exponents up to something like a couple of million. Um, and so uh, before whiles there was uh, quite a bit of evidence that this kind of statement might be true. Um, now, the point is that we only need to prove this for p greater than or equal to a couple million. In fact, we need to prove this. Um, we will prove this for at least uh, <coughs> exponent, prime exponent greater than or equal to 11. Um, and that will certainly be enough given these theorems um, that we already have from the classical mathematics. Um, and the, now the proof that we're looking at is um, it's, a, it's, an accumu it's really an accumulation of the efforts of a couple of mathematicians. Um, I'm sure everybody's heard the name. So there's Gerhard Frey, um, there's Jean-Pierre Serre, um, Ken Ribbett, Andrew uh, uh, Richard Taylor, and finally Andrew Wiles. And uh, well, of course, the, the, these people used uh, a vast literature of, 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 of mathematics that had accumulated over many years before that. But these are the people who seem really have been concentrating on, on trying to get Fermat's last theorem. Um, and so um, and this has been in the last, um, well, since about 1985. Okay, so Gerhard Frey started asking the right questions around 1985. Um, and what Gerhard Frey was was trying to do, um, his idea was that if you have a solution of Fermat's last, uh, Fermat, the Fermat equation, <coughs> a non-trivial solution, um, well then that would give you um, a rather remarkable triple of integers, in Fry's, Gerhard Frey's words, um, a, B, this a to the p, b to the p, c to the p would be a remarkable triple of integers, and um, well one somehow wants to um, sort of encode the remarkableness of these three integers, of this triple, in some kind of a mathematical object that, um, that we can use all the tools of modern mathematics and try to get some sort of contradiction from. Now, in particular, what he was suggested is that we should be able to um, get a contradiction by encoding that triple in a pair of objects, um, namely an elliptic curve, and a modular form. Okay, so <coughs> the idea was to use the theory of elliptic curves and the theory of modular forms to take a, a solution of the Fermat equation and code it up in some form that involves both elliptic curves and modular forms and try to get a contradiction. Um, and the the, uh, the way that one works with these things is through their Galois representations. Now, there are certain Galois representations that are attached to elliptic curves and modular forms. And uh, um, the program that eventually paid off was to try to get a contradiction by looking at these Galois representations. OK. Um, OK, so I'd like to start off. Uh, by thinking a little bit about elliptic curves. Um, <coughs> probably most people know about the theory of elliptic curves, but let me just very quickly make a few remarks. So, <coughs> so um, <coughs> we'll be interested in elliptic curves defined over Q. Um, an elliptic curve defined over Q, um, the fancy language is just a smooth projective algebraic curve of genus 1 defined over the rationals and having a marked rational point. Um, and well, of course, the, the point is that, in fact, we have a very simple way of representing such a thing as a Weierstrass, in terms of a Weierstrass equation. Any elliptic curve can be embedded in the projective plane um, and there will be defined by, in affine coordinates by some Weierstrass equation of this form where the coefficients a and b can be assumed to be integers um, and um, <coughs> um, well this elliptic curve has a minimal discriminant a 
called delta E, and we need to know that that discriminant is not zero. The discriminant is, is roughly speaking, uh, is, is, is very close to the discriminant of this cubic polynomial. Um, and so the discriminant, minimal discriminant is non-zero, just means that the roots of that polynomial are distinct. Um, okay, now, um, well, it's easy to think about these elliptic curves. We can, for example, think about the, the real points of an elliptic curve. Um, you think of that in the plane. Um, you look something like this. Um, um, there might be just one, one uh, part of it, but there might be two, depending on whether the cubic has uh, one or three real roots. Um, and we want to think of this in projective space. Um, and so that means that we want to sort of adjoin points at infinity in all directions. And there's one point on this curve that lives up in the vertical direction at infinity, and that's our special marked point. Okay? Um, so that was going to play the, the, the role of the, of the origin on the elliptic curve. Um, and, okay, so now one of the first things that one needs to know about elliptic curves is that um, they are algebraic groups. An algebraic group defined over the rationals, um, meaning that we can take two points on the elliptic curve and add them together to get a third point um, using a, the familiar uh, chord tangent rule uh, for adding points. Um, very nice way of seeing the structure of this group is to think about the complex points. So we know by the, by the theory of elliptic functions that the complex points on any such elliptic curve are complex analytically isomorphic to a complex torus of dimension one. Um, in other words, C modulo some lattice. So L will be some lattice contained in the complex plane. Um, you might think of it have omega 1 and omega 2 and the lattice that they generate. And when you mod out by the lattice, uh, you end up with this fundamental parallelogram with the opposite edges identified. And so what you see then is, is, a, is a torus. And so it's a genus 1 uh, Riemann surface. Um, but you also see a group structure. Uh, the complex numbers are an additive group, and when you mod out by the lattice, you still have a group. Um, you can even see the, these real points embedded in here. There'll be maybe, um, you get these two branches, that sit, sort of, so either there's one branch or two, but they sit here in this torus like that. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, now, for, for, from a number theorist's point of view, um, one of the things that we like to do, we want to study the arithmetic of this elliptic curve. Um, and so, of course, one of the main tools that we have is reduction modulo primes. So um, I want to think about reduction. So we fix the prime L, and we want to think about what we get when we reduce the curve modulo that prime. So when we view the curve over the finite field FL of L elements, um, well, there are three, three types of reduction that might come up. Um, uh, one of them is what we might call good, good reduction. Well, okay. So a good reduction just means that when you reduce the elliptic curve, it, it stays smooth. It might stay smooth. It might stay an elliptic curve. <coughs> okay, so that would correspond to the case where the, um, the three roots of that cubic polynomial, uh, where well, they're distinct in characteristic zero. When you reduce mod P they, or mod L, they stay distinct. Okay, so that's where the cubic has, still has three distinct roots. And then there are two other types, two other things that could happen. You could get multiplicative reduction. And that happens uh, when two of the roots of that cubic sort of coalesce, uh, mod L, um, and then you get uh, what's called a nodal singularity. The curve looks like this. Um, and um, the uh, last case is what's called additive reduction. Um, and that's where 
In fact, the three roots all come together into one when you reduce mod L. So you imagine these coming together, um, and you get a, a cuspidal singularity. Um, the language that one uses, one thinks of good reduction as being when the reduction is still an elliptic curve. And these two we call bad reduction. Um, and um, well, but the, but the feeling is somehow that, that the multiplicative reduction is not really as bad as the additive reduction. As it's not quite as bad. And so uh, we group these together, and we call them semi-stable reduction. Um, the reason for the terminology is, is that, um, in general, if you, if you have an elliptic curve over Q, if you increase the, the, the field, if you sort of raise the, the, the field Q to some number field, change the base, um, it can happen that additive reduction become, will happen, in fact, that additive reduction becomes either good or multiplicative for a sufficiently big change in the base. But the uh, semi-stable reduction will stay good. If it's good over Q, it's good over any number field. Um, if it's multiplicative over Q, then it'll stay multiplicative when you change the, change the base. And so additive, in some, case, in some sense, is not s stable. So we call these two cases uh, semi-stable. Um, now, um, <coughs> and we, oh, by the way, we say that an elliptic curve, the elliptic curve E itself is semi-stable. So E is semi-stable if and only if its reduction is semi-stable for all L, for every prime. <coughs> OK. Um, and in that case, what we do is we, we want to keep track of what the primes of bad reduction are. So we just form some, uh, the conductor, we'll call the conductor, conductor of E. Um, that's just the product of all the primes which are bad. In, in general, I'm sorry? E is semi-stable, e is semi right. Um, <coughs> in general, the, the, the word conductor has a technical uh, definition, and it just happens that in the semi-stable case, that technical definition of conductor reduces to just the product of the primes that have bad reduction. Okay. And this, by the way, is the case that we're going to be into. We're only going to be interested in semi-stable curves because that's the only one that the ones, those are the only ones that really come up in the proof of Fermat's last theorem. Okay. Um, now, um, there's another reason that semi-stable reduction um, is good, or at least multiplicative reduction is better than additive reduction, and that is that in the case where an elliptic curve has multiplicative reduction at L, you have a very nice description of what the, um, what the QL bar points on the elliptic curve look like. So if E, so this is the theorem of Tate, let me say it that way. So the theorem of Tate. Um, so if E is multiplicative at L, um, then the, if you take the L-adic rationals and look at QL bar, um, well, there will be some, some L-adic integer, which in fact will be divisible by L, not 0, um, such that um, the QL bar points on the elliptic curve can be described as QL bar, uh, the, the, the non-zero elements in this. So there's a, a nice multiplicative group. In fact, it's an analytic Lie group, an L-adic Lie group. Um, modulo, and then you divide by the multiplicative group generated by this QL. So the condition that QL is not zero and that it's um, not a unit um, guarantees that the group of, of, of integral powers of QL forms a discrete subgroup of this analytic group QL bar cross. Um, and so you can divide by that, and you get an analytic, an L-adic analytic group. And there's, in fact, an analytic, Tate's theorem is that there is an analytic isomorphism from the QL bar points to that. Um, it doesn't always quite commute with the action of the Galois group, but, um, but it does over some um, unramified quadratic extension, at least. Um, so the point is that somehow the multiplicative case is very beautiful because we have a, this very concrete description of the group of QL bar points. Okay. So in, in some sense, it, one, one almost feels that the multiplicative reduction case is better than the good reduction case. You get this nice concrete description. If you believe that, that, that QL bar is something that we understand, 
then, <laughs> then, you, then, you have, then you would say that that is some, maybe a little bit better. Um, okay, so, um, okay so, so that's a semi-stable curve. Um, Okay, um, <clears throat> all right, so the next thing we have to think about a little bit, um, so our Galois representations. So a Galois representation is just a representation of the Galois group. So G will be the Galois group of take the algebraic closure of Q over Q and look at the set of all automorphisms of Q bar. Um, call that the Galois group. Um, and then a, rep a Galois representation is just a, um, a, a continuous homomorphism, let me say two-dimensional, all the ones that we'll be looking at, two-dimensional. GL2 of some ring R, where R may be some topological ring, uh, might be a piatic ring, like ZP, or uh, a finite field FP, or a finite extension of FP, or something like that, um, or some complete Noetherian local ring with residue field, um, a piatic field, uh, I mean a finite field of characteristic P. Um, so I want this to be continuous. Galois group comes with a nice topology. Um, and, um, <coughs> well, when one studies these Galois representations, what one tries to think about um, uh, to help one get started is to think about the local behavior of them. So the local behavior. So you want to study localizations of the Galois representation. And so for that, um, I, I think it's convenient to f fix in one's mind um, you think of Q bar, um, you fix in two embed or a bunch of embeddings. So you know, fix an embedding of the algebraic numbers into the complex numbers. And you also, for each prime L, you fix an embedding into the algebraic closure of QL. Um, and then, um, you see, you can think about uh, the Galois group of C modulo uh, sort of the completion of Q, I guess. So G infinity would be the Galois group of the complex numbers modulo R. This would be the local Galois group at infinity. Um, and of course, that's just a generated by a single element of order two complex conjugation. Um, and for each L, um, you have the Galois group of QL bar over QL. We'll call that the, the local Galois group. And the point is that once we have an embedding of Q bar into each of these things, then we have a natural way of viewing these Galois groups as being contained in G. Namely, any automorphism of C certainly gives me an automorphism of Q bar. Any automorphism of QL bar certainly gives me an automorphism of Q. So it gives me a natural way of embedding these local Galois groups into the global Galois group. Okay, so um, these are the so-called decomposition groups. Um, okay. Um, now, um, in order to keep track of ramification, um, we need to think a little bit about the inertia group. So if I have a prime L, um, it acts on QL bar, and so in particular it acts on the, on the integers in QL bar, um, and so it acts on the reduction, it would, that, that action will preserve the maximal ideal, and so it will act on the reduction, and so we get a, a, a map from here to the Galois group of FL bar over FL, um, in fact, this map can be seen to be surjective, um, and its kernel is called the inertia group. So that's the inertia group, it's the kernel. Um, and um, we say that rho, this, this Galois representation, so we say that rho is unramified at L if and only if this is contained in the, uh, this inertia group is contained in the kernel of rho. Um, 
Okay. Um, so, um, uh, so that I should just say that most of the most of the Galois representations that come up in number theory um, have the property that they're unramified at all but finitely many primes L. Okay. Now the key property of this is that if you have, if you know that rho is unramified at L, then you know that the inertia group goes to one, and and that means that to know the uh, that rho, rho will factor through the Galois group of F L bar. Um, now we know this Galois group very very well. We know that it's generated topologically. Well, let me call it sigma L. There's some Frobenius element <coughs> that generates that Galois group topologically, um, and so. Uh, if you have an unramified representation at L, then um, that is equivalent to saying that rho, the rho restricted to that local Galois group is determined by rho of that Frobenius element. Okay, so that's a very, a very important thing. So it gives us a way of understanding. So when we have a, a representation that's unramified at L, we have a very nice way of understanding what, uh, what its localization at L is, in other words, what its restriction to this group is. And the same is true at infinity. Uh, to know what it looks like at infinity is just knowing what the value of rho is on this complex conjugation. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now I should add just one little remark, and that is that um, in general, um, the prime P has to be treated a little bit differently. It tends to be treated differently. Um, um, we, we look for something a little bit less than being unramified at the prime p. Um, that will come up later on when we're talking about um, uh, Weil's paper um, and other things. Um, and that at the prime p, we require that the representation be something called flat. Okay, so that will be talked about later on. I'm not going to try to say anything about that now. Um, okay. Um, okay. So now. Now, what is true about the Galois representations attached to elliptic curves? Or how, what are they, first of all? Um, so we fix a prime p. So I want to go back to my elliptic curve, E, and I have a, a prime, a fixed prime. So this prime will be fixed once and for all. Okay? Um, and, um, well, so if we think about the group of P torsion points on the elliptic curve. So remember that E is a is a is a group has a group structure. Um, we can think of um, <clears throat> we can think then of those points on the curve that um, that are when you add them to themselves P times you get the origin. So this will be um, some subgroup. I'll think of it as a subgroup of the algebraic points of of E. You see if if you take a a p-torsion point, you apply an element of the Galois group to it, you've got to get another, for any automorphism of C, you've got to send it to another uh, uh, p-torsion point. So these points have got to be defined over q-bar. Um, and so in particular, the Galois group will act on this thing. Um, it's not too hard to see that this is, as an abstract group, it's F, so it looks like FP2. Um, <clears throat> that you can see by just thinking about the description of the complex points on the elliptic curve of C modulo a lattice. Um, and so, um, you see, the Galois group acts on this, and since this looks like FP2, um, I can think of that as a, um, sort of a, a, I call that rho E bar, as a homomorphism from the Galois group to GL2 of FP. Okay? So that's the first thing. Uh, this is called the mod P representation. associated to E. Um, and uh, let's see, so uh, of course we can do this, uh, we don't have to do it for the prime, we can do it for prime powers, um, and if we do that, um, <coughs> so we can think about the P torsion, we can think about the P squared torsion, we can think about the P cubed torsion, etc. And each of these are connected by multiplication by P, um, well, the Galois group acts on all of them and commutes with the, the multiplication by P map, and so we get a, um, we can form the projective limit over all these things, um, and we get something that the Galois group acts on, 
um, and that's called the Tate module. So the Galois group acts on that. Um, this abstractly as a group looks like the uh, piatic integers cross the piatic integers. Um, and so this action of, of the Galois group on the Tate module gives me a representation of the Galois group into GL2 of ZP. Okay, so that's the piatic representation attached to the elliptic curve. Okay. Um, <coughs> okay, so now the first thing that you need to know is that, um, that the piatic Galois representation is unramified um, outside at all primes except those that divide the conductor of the elliptic curve times the prime p itself. Um, <coughs> okay. um, now, one of the things that's interesting about this is that um, it's clear that uh, and by the way, it was also definitely ramified at the primes that are in there. Okay. But one of the things that is interesting is that if you look at the mod p representation, it can happen, rho e bar, the mod p representation, might be ramified at fewer primes. Okay. The, 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 the piatic representation is ramified at all those primes, but it, the re reduction mod p might be ramified at fewer primes. And this is a phenomenon that plays, um, <coughs> um, that it comes up very strongly in the proof of Fermat's last theorem, plays a very important role. Um, and so uh, we'll be seeing a lot of this um, in the next week. Um, OK, so Now, there's a very simple fact about um, these, um, these semi-stable curves, um, which is worth noting, and that is that you can really say exactly um, sort of what the difference is between the ramification of rho sub e of rho sub e and the ramification of rho sub e bar. Um, you can really get your hands on that. And if e is semi-stable, um, of conductor, say, n e, um, then, um, <coughs> then in fact, um, and if, so with minimal discriminant delta e, then um, then, now what's true is that um, for L dividing the discriminant, I mean, sorry, the conductor, so for L a prime of bad reduction, um, yeah, and L not equal to P, so I'm going to break this up into two cases, and L is not P, not our special prime, um, then rho E is unramified, rho e bar is unramified at L if and only if the piatic ordinal of, I'm sorry, the L attic ordinal of the, I'm sorry, the p attic ordinal um, of the, the L attic, I'm sorry, the, the L attic ordinal of the minimal discriminant <laughs> Um, is um, <coughs> divisible by p. Okay, so in other words, um, if the power of L that goes into the minimal discriminant is a p power, or then, um, then in fact, uh, when you reduce the representation mod p, it will be unramified, even though it's ramified before you reduce. Um, and second of all, if L equals p, then 
uh, I remember I said something about flatness. So rho e bar is flat at p, if and only if uh, p divides the p-adic ordinal. Uh, so if the power of p that's in there um, is a is a is a pth power, um, then um, um, then it w the representation will be flat at p. So these are sort of, in other words, when you reduce, things become better sometimes. Um, <coughs> okay. Um, and the proof of this, by the way, is just that uh, you just look at the, the, the analytic description that Tate gave us for the um, QL bar points on the elliptic curve, and think about that a little bit. Um, um, and you, there's a nice relationship between the minimal discriminant and that, that parameter Q. Um, so one uses that. Um, okay, so, um, okay, so now what did Fry do? So um, the strategy somehow is to get Fermat's last theorem mixed up into all of this. Um, and so Gerhard Frey suggested that we think about um, a particular elliptic curve. So suppose that you had a solution of Fermat's last, or of the Fermat equation. Um, So this is Fry. Suppose that you had a solution of the Fermat equation um, with a, b, c not zero, um, and say they're co-prime. Might as well. Um, then um, he says, think about the following elliptic curve. You take and you code up, you want to encode this triple of integers into an elliptic curve. Here it is. Um, you take y squared is x times x minus a to the p times x plus b to the p. Um, and you do have to assume, you can assume that a is minus 1 mod 4. And you might as well assume that b is 0 mod 2. That's OK. Um, I'll suppose that the prime p is at least 5. That's OK. Um, and um, well, so this is this curve right here. We now call a Fry curve. Um, and um, well, it, this curve has some rather peculiar properties um, that Fry pointed out. Um, in fact, he pointed out quite a few peculiar properties that it had. Um, but um, uh, the one that is relevant to what we're going to do um, is the following. Um, and that is that this elliptic curve is, first of all, semi-stable. Um, its conductor is the product over all those primes that divide A, B, C, all the primes that occur in the A, B, and C. Um, and the minimal discriminant can be calculated. That's not hard. That's just uh, two, uh, 1 over 2 to the eighth times take a, b, c, and raise it to the 2p power. Um, and um, well, what one sees here is that the minimal discriminant is almost a pth power. It's almost a pth power. Um, and so according to um, that theorem right there, um, that means that for this particular curve, for this curve, um, the, uh, the difference between the ramification of the piatic representation and the mod p representation is rather serious. So um, the corollary of this and that um, is that, uh, that for that choice of that e this elliptic curve, um, and that is that rho, so the, the, the mod p representation is unramified outside 2 times p. And at p, it's flat. It's what's called flat. We'll worry about that later. Um, and is flat at the prime p. Okay. Even though rho e itself um, has lots and lots of ramification, when you reduce it mod p, all that ramification goes away. And this is, so, this is a rather peculiar property for a Galois representation to have. 
Um, there's no obvious contradiction to anything at this point, but, um, but it is a peculiar property, and so uh, one begins to wonder if maybe one might be able to use that to uh, get some kind of a contradiction to Fermat's last theorem. Okay, so the existence of a solution of Fermat's last theorem gives us the existence of a, of a Galois representation with this uh, interesting property. Okay, now in order to get that contradiction, um, Fry says, well, we should, we should try to connect this to the theory of modular forms somehow. make a few quick remarks about modular forms. Um, okay, um, so in fact, uh, it's a cusp form that we want to think about. Um, so um, a cusp form or a modular form, is a function on the upper half plane. Okay, so the upper half plane, that's just the set of complex numbers that are above the real axis, so the, um, uh, those with imaginary part positive. Um, and we know that the group SL2Z acts on that by fractional linear transformations. Um, and so if we have a positive integer n, and if we define the group gamma zero of n, this is going to be a subgroup of SL2z, the set of all matrices A, B, C, D in SL2z with the property that the lower left-hand corner is congruent to zero mod n. Um, if we think about that group, that group is going to act on the upper half plane as well. Um, and well, a cusp form then is a function on the upper half plane that has a lot of symmetry on it when you sort of operate on it with this group. Um, and so, um, precisely, um, <coughs> so the notation will be, let me write over here. <coughs> so I'll think about the space of cusp forms of weight two, in fact. So these are weight two cusp forms of level n. And so an element of that space is a function on the upper half plane, which is holomorphic. Um, it has a lot of symmetry with respect to the action of this group gamma zero of n. Um, namely, um, if you look at Cz plus, if you sort of operate on the function via some element of that group and multiply by this autom automorphic factor, you get the same function back again um, for all gamma in gamma zero of n. Um, and uh, the third property is one about uh, how this function behaves as you approach infinity, as you approach the cusps. Um, and so that condition uh, can be stated this way, um, namely that the limit of f of z as z approaches some rational number is zero. In fact, you should also say that for infinity. So in other words, I think of some rational point down here on the boundary, and if I take some, some arc, some geodesic terminating at that rational number and take the limit of the function as you approach that rational number, you should get zero, no matter what rational number you pick, and also at infinity. Um, now, one of the first consequences of this is that, um, well, by the second property, we know that the matrix, let's see, we have the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1. That's certainly in gamma 0 of n. And so the second property then says that the function is invariant under translation by 1. And that means that it has a Q expansion, or a Fourier expansion. So, um, so F then has to look like, has to have some Fourier expansion of this form where Q is e to the 2 pi i z. Uh, in fact, the, the fact that it's translation invariant by one just means that you might have a Fourier expansion that goes infinitely far in both directions. But the fact that, it, that the function vanishes as you approach infinity uh, guarantees that, in fact, there are no negative powers of Q that appear in here. Um, and so um, the function will have a, and any cusp form of weight two will have a, a Fourier expansion like that. It's called the Q expansion. 
Um, okay, now. Okay, um, and so, um, <clears throat> well, the next thing that one has to mention are the, what are called the HECA operators. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> well, so, HECA operators, we get one HECA operator for each prime um, L. Um, in fact, it's convenient to distinguish two kinds of primes. So let me think of L and Q as primes, where L is a prime that does not divide the level of my modular forms, and Q might be a prime that does divide the level. In that case, we have, for every prime of the first sort, we get an operator TL that acts on that. Um, and for primes Q of the second sort, we get some operator which we call the U operator, UQ acting. Um, and, um, well, so in particular, we think of the, what's called the Hecke algebra, of level N. This is just the, the ring generated over Z by the, all of the operators TL and all of the operators UQ. This is going to be some subalgebra of the endomorphism ring of this space of cusp forms. <coughs> And um, what one's interested in um, is, a, um, is to find eigenforms. So find elements of the space of cusp forms that are eigenforms for these Hecke operators. Um, and in fact, we have a very simple, without telling you exactly what the operators are, I can tell you what it means to be a, an eigenform. So F is an eigenform, is a T of N eigenform, if and only if. When you take the Q expansion of the function, and you make it into a Dirichlet series by writing it this way, taking the CNs as the coefficients of a Dirichlet series. Um, if that Dirichlet series has what's called an Euler product, so it has to look like, say, some product over primes L dividing N, I'm sorry, not dividing N, of 1 minus, say, AL, L to the minus S plus L to the 1 minus 2S, some horrible rational function in L to the minus S, but you invert it so you get a power series in L to the minus S, I'll multiply those all together, and then take the product over those primes Q that do divide in 1 minus AQ, Q to the minus S inverse. When you multiply that out, you'll get a, a Dirichlet series. Um, if that Dirichlet series is equal to the Dirichlet series that you got by, from the modular form, up to multiplication by a constant, a non-zero constant, um, then, um, then one says that, that, that that is equivalent to saying that the form F is an eigenform for all of the Heck operators. And, and in fact, and in fact, um, one can even read off of this what the um, um, what the eigenvalues are. So in that case, we even know that if you take TL of F, you get AL times F, and if you take UQ of F, you just get AQ times F. So the coefficients that go in these Euler uh, products. Um, are the eigenvalues of the Hecke operators. Okay? Um, okay, so now the. Um, first thing, or the most important thing for us that we need to know about these um, is, um, um, is a theorem of Eiffel and Schumora. Uh, namely, that if you have an eigenform, then there is a Galois representation attached to it by a very, that has a very particular property. Um, um, so the i the Shimura theorem says that if F is as above, F is an eigenform of level N, weight, the weight will always be 2, um, <coughs> then, um, <coughs> then in fact there exists a unique Galois representation 
So our piatic Galois representation, P is our fixed prime, um, rho f from the Galois group to uh, GL2 of some ring of piatic integers. Um, so here, O, F is in fact going to be the integers in, um, you take Q, P, and you adjoin all of these eigenvalues of the modular form. One knows that those eigenvalues are algebraic, and so in fact they generate a finite extension of Q, so they'll generate, certainly generate a finite extension of Q, P. So we think of the ring of integers in that in that, uh, uh, find it in that local field, and that's OF. Um, so what the eisler schmorr theorem says is that there is a unique Galois, piatic Galois representation of this sort, um, such that rho F is unramified outside NP. And second of all, if we have a prime that doesn't divide NP, then we can even say what the characteristic polynomial of the Frobenius element is under this representation. Then, um, if you take, uh, um, <coughs> take, take the determinant of 1 minus, take rho of sigma L, rho F of sigma L, the Frobenius at L uh, times T, um, take that, so this sort of quasi-characteristic polynomial, um, what you get is 1 minus A L times T plus L times T squared. Um, so in other words, the characteristic polynomial of the Fabanius element at, at such a prime can be, it, it can be read off of the eigenvalues of the Heck operators, and in fact, the, um, the polynomial that you get is the same one that appeared in the Euler product expansion of the um, Dirichlet series associated to the form F. Okay. Um, I should just add a little remark. Moreover, if F has, uh, has Z co for coefficients, so if the Q expansion, the coefficients in the Q expansion are, um, are in Z, has of uh, coefficients which are integers, then, in fact, there exists an elliptic curve associated to the modular form, to the cusp form, which is defined over Q. And the Galois representation, the piatic Galois representation of that elliptic curve is, in fact, equivalent to the piatic Galois representation of the modular form. It's not too hard to actually describe that um, elliptic curve, but I don't really have time for it, so I'm, I'm sure someone will do it in a later talk. Um, okay, um, <coughs> now, now we come to the um, <coughs> to the conjecture of Shimura and Taniyama. Um, <coughs> which is the <coughs> which is the key ingredient that um, Wiles filled so we have you see if we have what, what this eisler shimura theory says is that um, if you have a, uh, an eigenform, if f is an eigenform uh, with z coefficients, then we can get from it an elliptic curve. In fact, there's a very precise statement of what the conductor of that elliptic curve will be in terms of the, of the, the, the conductor of the form f. Um, but um, the, the, the elliptic curves that one gets using the eisler shimura theory, these are called modular elliptic curves. Okay, so these are called the, um, I should say, E over Q. And so the form F goes to 
a particular element. So we don't get, we might not get, for all we know at this point, we might not get all elliptic curves defined over Q, but any elliptic curve defined over Q that we get from such an eigenform um, is called a modular elliptic curve. So these are called modular elliptic curves. And we have a very famous conjecture of Shimura and Taniyama and Bay. Um, <coughs> Namely, um, that every elliptic curve over Q is modular. Okay. Um, now, um, what Wiles proved um, earlier this year, finished finished the proof, um, is the following. So this is a theorem of Wiles, and at one crucial point. He had a very important help from Richard Taylor. Um, what he proved is that every semi-stable elliptic curve over Q is modular. <clears throat> OK. Um, all right. So. Um, I don't have too much that we're going to be spending a lot of time in the next week and a half thinking about why this is true, but I want to get to the punchline of wh why it implies from Oz's last theorem. Um, and, um, well, the reason comes from some work of Ken Ribbit um, about, uh, about nine years ago, 80, 1986, 1987. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> following. Um, so we have Ribbit's theorem which says that if you have uh, an eigenform of level n and you um, <clears throat> if you think about the the Galois representation attached to um, that uh, eigenform and reduce it mod modulo p or modulo the maximal ideal in OF, um, and if this is irreducible, then, um, then the following is true. And suppose, um, then uh, and suppose, and suppose, <coughs> and suppose first of all um, that we have some divisor, some prime divisor of n, um, and um, rho f bar is unramified at L. Um, and here I want to assume that L is not P. Or, second of all, maybe L divides N and L equals P. In that case, I want to say that uh, at rho F bar is flat. Let me just write that down here. <laughs> okay. Or, respectively, flat um, if L equals P. Um, <clears throat> then, in fact, we can remove L from the level. Okay, so if this is true, then there exists an eigenform of level n over L such that the Galois representation attached to the mod p Galois representation attached to that form is the same as the, Gal as the representation for rho f. Okay, so what this is doing is giving us something very concrete that we can get our hands on um, that says something about what happens when the amount of ramification in the reduction of the, um, of the Galois representation is less than the ramification in the, um, in the representation itself. OK, so now let me just uh, finish up by writing down uh, proof.
So here's the proof of Fermat's last theorem. So let's assume that P is a prime greater than or equal to 5 or 11 or something. Um, then, um, well, so then we have, um, and suppose that we have a solution, a non-trivial solution of Fermat's last theorem. Uh, these are co-prime integers. Um, then we let E be the Fry curve. Um, and, um, well, so then Fry tells us that E is semi-stable. And also tells us that rho E bar, the, re the mod P representation, is unramified outside to P and flat at P. Okay. Well, um, once we have that, then we know from Weyl's theorem, we know that since E is semi-stable, there has to be uh, some uh, eigenform associated to it. So Weyl's tells us that there exists an eigenform someplace um, such that the Galois representation attached to that eigenform is equal to the Galois representation attached to the elliptic curve. Well, but you see then, uh, the reduction, the rho f bar, will be unramified outside to p and will be flat at p. Um, and so it has this odd property, and we can use Ribbit's theorem. So then Ribbit, Ribbit's theorem tells us then that, in fact, we can remove all of the primes from the level except maybe 2. Right? We can move everything except for 2p using this. And the fact that it's flat at p, we can remove p if we need to. Um, and so, um, in fact, we know then that there has to exist an eigenform g of level 2, um, such that the reduction rho f bar is equal to the reduction rho g bar. So the, the mod, these two mod p representations are the same. Um, and this is a contradiction. Um, and see, the point here is that now we've got a modular form, a, a cusp form of weight 2 and level 2, but the space of cusp forms of weight 2 and level 2 um, it can, is completely known. I mean, it's a very simple thing to compute. Um, and so we calculate that, and we find that the space of cusp forms of weight 2 and level 2 is, in fact, just the zero space. So we've constructed a non-zero element of a zero space, and so that is a contradiction. And that finishes the proof of Fermat's last theorem, um, modulo all of these things, um, <coughs> which we're going to talk about in the next nine days. OK, thank you very much. <laughs>I have one more announcement, um, and that is that um, I don't know if people have seen the, the uh, T-shirts outside. Uh, the, the, there's, we have a, a program that we run during the summer here at Boston University, which is coming to an end this week. It's called the Promise Program, the Program in Mathematics for Young Scientists. Um, and uh, well, they've been thinking a lot about Fermat's last theorem during the last six weeks, um, and so they, they designed a, a T-shirt. They made a T-shirt um, that they're selling as sort of a fundraiser for the Promise program for these high school kids. Um, and you might think about going over and, and buying one of these. There's, a, there's an outline of the proof on the front with all the main references on the back. It's for good cause. Um, OK, so uh, we, we had a bunch of them. And I understand that we're almost completely sold out already. Uh, we only had 150, I think. Um, and there were about 16 left at last count. Um, and um, so what's going to end up happening, if you want one, find someone, um, and you have to place an order. You don't have to give anybody any money. Just place an order. Um, and, uh, and then uh, uh, later on, we'll, we'll know how many more to order. We'll order that many, and, uh, and uh, we'll give them to you later on. Okay. <coughs>